Hi, everyone. This is Judy Warner with the On Track Podcast. Welcome back. We are recording today from DesignCon 2018 in Santa Clara, California. Today, I have another amazing guest, Kelly Dack. And before we get started, I want to make sure that you subscribe uh, on your RSS, your favorite RSS feed. And also, please follow me on LinkedIn or on Twitter at, at Altium Judy. And Altium is also on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. So please give us a follow, and we'll continue to put out as much good content for designers and engineers as we can possibly wrestle. So uh, today I am with um, Kelly Dack, who is a PCB designer. Are you CID or CID plus? CID plus. CID plus. So he's a hot shot. So he's uh, a designer for many years. Um, currently, he is with a Northwestern EMS provider. And how many years have you been in the industry, Kelly? Oh, too many to mention. I Thanks know. for having me, Judy. I know. <laughs> I know. I, I don't want to tell him. I, I know. thought you were going to introduce me as, look what the cat dragged in. Yeah. Uh, no. Well, that, No. But, uh, yeah, I've been in the industry uh, since 80, 78, something like that. Okay, well, longer than me, of, so. A lot of design work. Yeah, I don't like to say when I started either, but I, I think I started in 84. Wow. I know. Wow. I know. I don't want to say how old I am, but it just automatically dates me. So, Kelly, so we're here at Design Con, and I know you have a completely broad perspective at this industry because you've been on the journalistic side you've been on the design side you know about fabrication now you're on the ms side uh, you just mentioned that the design that's being done at uh, at your current place um that you have all team designers so we like you better already and so um tell us uh you and i started to talk and i'm just going to let you roll because i know you have a wealth of uh things to share so start out with ready what is design wow Wow. <laughs> what is design? What uh, is it? Design, it, 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 I've been talking about that with uh, a cohort of mine, Andy Shaughnessy, all morning. Uh, because we come to a show like this, and we're talking design relative to high speed and things measured in gigahertz. Right. And things like this. Typically, uh, the engineering crowd or the degreed crowd. Uh, but they have to relate also, uh, the stuff has to be translated into uh the classic or traditional PC board designer. There's been a lot of talk about the two merging. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about where's the next generation of the PCB designer yep. coming from. You oh, know? yeah. No, uh, yeah. Somebody told me yesterday, uh, you know, these guys are all dying out. <laughs> and we chuckled, but, you know, it's... Uh, it's a fact that we're all at least, you know, hopefully retiring happily uh, so that this this generation of folks that started in the 70s doing board design and earlier uh, are are moving on. And there's been a concern about where uh, the gap is going to be filled. And after a, a couple years ago, I had a chance to uh, have a brief stint in the Seattle area. And I, I found the answer to that question. Uh, I worked for uh, Prototron for a brief amount yeah, of time there. Yeah, I love there. Prototron, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Uh, and part of my job was to reach out to designers uh, in all of the Seattle area. And so my job was to go in, drive downtown, shake hands with designers, and uh, turn them on to uh, the great things that Prototron does. Well, these these people were not old designers. Right. These, these people were young, hip uh People that had just graduated out of university had picked up uh, the design tools and because they're quick studies and they're smart, exactly. uh, learned it in a matter of weeks probably, <laughs> it, at least that's what they make it seem like. Yeah. They're quick studies and they were laying down tracks right and left. And uh, my job was to go help them from the standpoint of how they can make their designs flow through our shop. Uh, a lot easier right so it w it was a little customer liaison uh, yeah. engineering li liaison so I was very surprised to find out that the uh, the designers are out there now they're out there well by the way Kelly I've talked a, a lot about this and if you actually read my newsletters that I sent you just kidding uh, <laughs> Just needling you a little bit. No, I've actually found since I've been at Altium 
the same exact thing you're finding is that one, this next generation, they basically came out of the womb with a smartphone in their hand, right? right. And playing computer games. So they learn so much faster. And in the case of Altium, and we're certainly not the only ones out there, we are um, sponsoring engineering teams and stuff in universities. And so much now, right, engineers are laying out their own boards. It's not a distinct role. And so these kids are bright and they're quick. And now I'm seeing globally, I would have never seen it had I not been where I am now, but I see exactly, I would echo your exact thoughts, is that I see them everywhere. They're on Hyperloop teams. They're on um, SAE, you know, formula teams. They're on, they're in engineering groups. They're in space teams. And, and they are learning to lay out boards in college. And in our case, we're gifting the software, right? So they have a tool, a professional tool. So when they graduate, it's easier for them to get a job too so I, I see it I and I'm so glad to hear you say it because I feel like the only one that's kind of like don't be afraid people it really is going <laughs> to be okay well we'll check it out now uh, the product is called Altium Designer and there's a lot of designer based products out there uh, that infer and rightly so it's a very powerful design tool but back to your question what is design yeah uh it has to do with a depth of knowledge that's gained not necessarily by a design tool. A design tool is, is uh, only as good as the knowledge of the designer, the Absolutely. knowledge base of the designer. Yep. So what I, what I mentioned and what, what was fascinating, uh, working at a, a prototype bareboard supplier, and now I didn't mention, but, uh, or you mentioned that I work at an EMS provider doing assembly work now. Uh -huh. uh, and there's, there's a similar uh, stream of challenges that the same problems and issues that we would see at the bareboard supplier that needed coaching or mentorship mm -hmm. for the designers uh, are, are happening and echoing through to the assembly uh, suppliers. Right. Right. So uh, we're seeing problems like uh, copper pullback uh, from the board edge. Uh, who knows how much that is uh, needs to be. In other words, if you're going to if you're going if a designer is going to design, they need to consider all the stakeholders of the process. Who's going to be building this board? What are the processes that are involved in building this board? And there's many, there are many, many. Many, many along y the way. Yes, and this is, I think, uh, many would agree that that's what's maybe, I've never taken one of those university design courses, but uh, I know they go fast and I know sometimes they're measured in weeks, not years. Exactly, um, except I will tell you, I don't mean to interrupt your that's okay. thought pattern here, but um, I was, overjoyed and I think you'll be glad to hear this too and maybe you already know this that Eric Bogatin is teaching at the University of Colorado Boulder and, right and on, we were yes, able, I have yeah so you know he he and a um, colleague have written a curriculum that's PCB design with manufacturing and assembly best practices included right right holy cow like to me that's like the mother load because <laughs> it's in context yeah. Like you said, of all the stakeholders. So, anyways, continue yeah, and, on. I, I know I'm, Eric's really good at, at boot camp philosophy. Right. Uh, hit the hit the ground running, but you know, know where the ground is and, and be <laughs> able to. I, I can't imagine he's not you know encouraging uh, the folks that go through his programs to. I can't imagine he's not encouraging them to go visit yeah. boots on the ground at Absolutely. the board supplier and the assembly yep. supplier so they can see and meet the people mm -hmm. uh, who, are, who are doing the work. Mm -hmm. So back to design. What is design? Uh, design has to do with having a product, dreaming a product, and then embedding or creating all the uh, process steps within the, the layout so to speak. Maybe, maybe that uh, sounds too simple. But from the standpoint of uh, what can go wrong, it, <laughs> it everything thousands, thousands, literally of, things can go thousands wrong. of things can go wrong at, as, a, as a new board designer starts, starts designing. Uh, w one, of the things, one of the things that uh, uh, 
uh, the software tools or the layout tools are doing so well is uh, they have a lot of, is this a word, manipulatable uh, constraints, right? Setup constraints, right. Uh, DRC rules and mm -hmm, things. Mm -hmm. And uh, being a relatively new user to Altium, I am amazed at how many things you can control in Altium. It is, it is just amazing. Uh, now, uh, at, from a new user standpoint, uh, that can be a blessing, but yeah. that can be a curse. Uh -huh. if, if, because all of these setups are are off the shelf setups they're default settings right right so what what a designer to be called a designer needs to be able to have the knowledge of doing is is manipulating those constraints so that uh, it will yield the best outcome for all the stakeholders in the process what do I mean by stakeholders yeah I was gonna ask you that so um, we, we can't, as a designer, a true designer, we can't design in a vacuum. We can't have our own uh, office in our own world and live in a vacuum and think that this product we're creating, uh, this, this chunk of clay, I'm bad at metaphors, uh, <laughs> this chunk of clay is gonna be beautiful when we're done with it uh, because there's nobody else looking at it. What I'm trying to say is, uh, design has to do with reaching out and considering who is going to be putting this thing together. It's not the designer, typically. Right. The designer is not the one uh, plating and etching. Right. Uh, we define things like stack ups. We define uh, we define uh, trace widths and via sizes and uh, placement things right but what do we base those things on this is this is at the core of design what are we basing um, these design attributes on and without getting out and shaking hands with the stakeholders in the industry right the bareboard fabricator for instance right. uh, the engineer that maybe it may have uh, designed uh, the schematic uh, the test folks Yep. The people that are going to be uh, having to test mm -hmm. uh, this this board. Yep. Uh, the assembler, the people that are going to have to be putting the, the uh, stenciling the paste, uh, the solder paste onto the board, and uh, applying the parts. Uh, who else is down the line? There's there's so many others. The customer, the overall. Oh customer yeah, the customer. Themselves. What about the you know the box builder or you know, maybe interconnecting devices, you know, and cable, cable and, you know, harness, sure, who knows? Like sure. Being in order, I'll, I'll keep it short. To design is to be in touch with all the needs of those people, the stakeholders of the, uh, and their processes. Okay. So I 100% agree with you. I've been beating this drum blogging and writing about it for a long time except i feel like people look at me and go i remember one old school guy that i've known for a long time he goes it's so girly <laughs> like because like what to have a relationship with your fabricator is girly what the heck like it was just sort of a silly comment but my my point was you can't design in a silo just like you're saying you can't design in a vacuum um, if you don't, that design intent, one, has to be communicated, and you have to need, know you can design something amazing, and our, not only Altium, all the EDA tools out there are extremely powerful, and they can let you do really stupid stuff from a manufacturer's standpoint. It's so true. You get to be the Wizard of Oz, and then it's completely unbuildable on the other end. You know, So if you're not in touch, now I'm going to ask you a loaded question. I, I know you, Kelly, you've been in lots of board shops and EMS shops, and you're very well connected to that, that stream of stakeholders. How has your CID, CID Plus helped equip you for that? Has it, or is it from, does it equip you more theoretically and then you gotta go get your boots on the ground? Wow, uh, not a loaded question at all. Okay, uh, uh, I just don't want to get you in trouble I, with I, IPC if you don't have no, an Not answer. at all, <laughs> not at all. Um, I got to say, I, I went for my CID back in uh, the 90s uh, while I was during my time down in San Diego, and it, was, it had been an evolving program, 
and I paid for it myself. I, at, at that point, there was no convincing a company, a telecom company, that, hey, there's the certification that will help give me an in-depth knowledge of all the processes, and uh, it, it wasn't happening. So I, I went and uh, did it on my own dime, yeah. and that was CID. And that was a long, long time ago, and a lot, of, a lot has happened with the program and with technology mm -hmm. since then. But I've got to say that the thing that I uh, loved about it was that it, it described the stakeholders of the process. It defined the, the, uh, the start to finish process of how to manufacture a board, how to document a board for manufacturing and for inspection, uh, and even uh, explaining that that the fabrication drawing is not as much of a how-to document as it is an inspection document. Right. We're, we're oh, not, that's a we're good not, point. We're not telling with a fabrication drawing. We're not telling the supplier how to do it. They know how to do it with the data, right? right? They have all the data in the world that tells them how to do it. But there but, are parameters that are. Um, right. I mean, there are parameters, but the the difference is they are nominal parameters. Everything in CAD data that we know of is mostly nominal data, right? Yes. You lay a, you lay a line width down at uh, seven mil, right? Seven thousandths of an inch wide. Uh, if you think that that line is going to end up seven thousandths of an inch wide on the board when you're done. You may be in for surprise. Right. Uh, you may not be in. You know, it, it depends on manufacturing tolerance. And without recognizing manufacturing tolerances, uh, we're doomed. Right. Uh, so the, the program helped well, me. Well, and let's just say that, that you know, uh, this gets a little crazy to me is some, because a lot of engineers have not had the benefit of being inside a board house and because they are used to using a lot of um you know physics based tools and stuff they think it's seven mils make it seven mils if you don't understand how to print a circuit board is made the print and edge process what happens inside of an etchant bath it is not possible let me tell you engineers i'm you know i don't mean to be condescending at all it's it's a uh, i really care about this that it cannot be made perfectly seven mils, ever. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's that's why we have tolerances, plus or minus, this or that. But now with these high speed stuff, it's like, oh yeah, can you give us a one mil trace, plus or minus zero? And I'm like, no, <laughs> yeah. no, 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 no. Yeah. And so, I don't. Yeah. Well, very, very important to understand that. And like I say, back to the CID uh, program. Uh, from IPC, uh, I, I had gone on years later. I went yeah. back and, and did the advanced uh, the advanced portion of that course, the CID plus. And I got to say that uh, it when I didn't go job jumping very often, but when I did uh, in this particular case, uh, I was able to list my CID, and uh, they seemed to scratch their head a little bit at, at the interview process. But when I was able to to uh, when I was able to define uh, or describe just what I've described to you uh, about about some in-depth knowledge of the processes and the people involved, mm -hmm. that's when I got their attention. Oh. So this, this is what I'm saying, that the CID program helps uh, that in a lot of ways. Uh, and CID plus all, all the more uh, goes into more advanced, uh, advanced uh, processes and uh, ideas about circuit boards. Uh, fast forward uh, to a few years ago, uh, I was invited to, uh, from the EPDEC company, uh, uh -huh. and Gary Ferrari was invited to help instruct now uh, the program. So I uh, got my certification to teach oh, the did? CID program. Oh, you did? I didn't know you did that. Okay. I did that. And, uh, let me tell you, that is wonderful to take a class of 10 or 20 people uh, through the materials that have been uh, that have been evolving, but right. are now pretty much set in stone as a real solid curricula for what was a three day class, three days of intensive uh, 
uh, review of materials that uh, the students have been studying for months. Right. Uh, now it's a four day, it, it, we've expanded it. it. It was going, there's so much information in there. It's, uh, it, they expanded it to a four day class and the pressure that you see on some of these students' faces as we're getting toward test time, because it's an exam, it's, mm -hmm. it's an audited exam, very official, uh, there's a lot of pressure. And let me tell you that the pass rate is very, very high uh, now because of the, the uh, level of training and the level of study materials. I mean, you need to study this material. It's not easy. Right. Uh, we're, we're condensing a lot of material into, into a four-day class. Uh, the, the, the expressions on some of these designers, they are designers. Right. But they have, now they have more of an in-depth knowledge of design, what design is. You know, it's it's stakeholders and it's processes and it's materials and and things that now that we're giving them is a lot more in depth. When they pass that test, I have had people jump and hop around and clinch their fists <laughs> and say yes. They they are so happy to have have done this and it's really gaining traction. Uh, uh, as far as a certification we talked about university classes and you know maybe oh, those are measured nothing. in weeks yeah uh, well and cid like you are saying really has to do w with the stakeholders you mentioned right where in the university as you said i've heard some professors say yeah i teach i teach printed circuit board design but don't be impressed it's three 50 minute classes one on schematic, one on routing, and one on whatever. Yes, and let me tell you, I, I was in third grade classes and fourth grade classes where at least we jump on a bus and go visit the fire station. Field trips. Right? right. We talk about the fire station, but at least we hold hands and I'll walk up to it or you jump on a bus and go see it. I'd like to uh, challenge all of those university professors right now to, to get their students on a bus and go visit uh, a, a board shop or an Amen. EMS supplier. Wouldn't Amen. that be especially, oh my gosh. especially in this area where you, you and have I so can many be in them. like a gospel choir about this? I'm <laughs> Amen, telling you. Sister. Amen, sister. <laughs> Amen, brother. No, I, I feel the same because I think there really is a disconnect there. And sometimes, honestly, on the board side, there's a disconnect in our understanding right, of what the designers are. And sometimes we treat them like, you know, we get all. Cr you know, instead of like partnering with them and going, what are you trying to accomplish and how can we get together and move you in that direction? So it, it can go both ways. It's not just one way. Absolutely. I heard, I didn't get a chance to attend uh, the Altium event. Uh, Altium Live. Yes, Altium Live. Don't miss it uh, but this I, year. Well, I have heard so many great things. I mean, powerful, powerful things Thank you. Uh, from people that uh, attended. And uh, the people that were there, the notables that were there, yeah. speaking. Oh, Happy my Holden, goodness. Lee Ritchie. Yeah, we had the we had the big guns there. Yeah, yeah. But but speaking along those lines, I think again, you and I are just lockstep on this issue. And um, when I began at at Altium, they said, okay, you know, we're going to give you a team to pull this event off, Judy. But you're going to run the strategy, and you're going to get the speakers. And I'm like, okay. And so I'm like, designers need to hear from other designers, right? So it's not just theoretical, but they also need to hear from fabricators, assemblers. They need to hear from the whole gamut. Right on, so yes. we did a call for papers, but we also had people talking about what you need to know when you're designing flex circuits, because you might all of a sudden have to be doing flex or rigid flex and you didn't have to do them before or multi-board systems. So, um, you know, we worked to get kind of sprinkle that in throughout and then also have sponsors who were there that they could interact with. And uh, boy, I, I knew it would be a good experience, but I didn't know how good, Kelly. I can't wait. You have to come this year. Yes, yes. And, I'm looking um, to, forward to it. It's, yeah. It sounds very holistic. PCB design holistic. Holis <laughs> this is holi very zen. Yeah, it's very no. zen. But uh, yeah, uh, amazing. Eat, so, sleep, and breathe. PCB and and design. we didn't, and we, we tried really hard not to do was just to beat the Altium drum, like sell, buy our stuff. Here's our new. Of course, we're plow, 
proud of our tools and our new releases. So out of two days, we took two 45-minute slots for ourselves. Yeah. And the rest was about them, resources, plugging them in. And I remember um, Lawrence Roma and my colleague saying, oh, my gosh, these people, it's like they're, they're really inches away, you know, as far as functionality goes, but they never talk to each other. And I said, exactly right. And so to put them all together and the energy was just absolutely electric. So yeah, yeah, come, come again. And yeah, yeah, definitely. We will, we'll love to have you. So that's been truly, it was a highlight of my career, honestly, to see Uh that all those light bulbs go out, probably how you feel after you teach a CID class, (laughs) you know, I I saw this afterglow. Yeah, the, the afterglow. afterglow. Yes, we were all seeing kumbaya at the end. So, <laughs> well um, done. I heard great things. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It was really, it was a blast. And it was a giant team effort. I could, you know, I'm not tuning around horn at all. I just got to go get the speakers and Oh, my gosh. I team worked really hard to do all the logistics stuff. And they did an amazing job. So. So I'm, I'm, I'm dying to interview you, and I'm trying not to. I, I know I'm being interviewed. So I, I'm just dying to ask. Uh, again, being a new Altium user, uh, I know uh, version 18's out. Yeah. And I don't want to ask you about it because that would be me interviewing you. But as a new user, I have to say that uh, I'll confess, you know, a lot of this 3D capability uh, that I haven't been exposed to in the past oh. and now becoming... Uh, becoming new to it yeah uh i i've got to say it's it's a lot easier than i thought it would be and it, well, like good. i say altium's my first tool to uh, have introduced me to that so that's that's where the industry's going yeah and i found that it's it's pretty easy now to communicate with my mechanical cohorts you know yeah, because that's a, uh, that's, that's a another, major goal we're back to design uh, the design flavor of our discussion is uh, it's not only electrical constraints yep. that we're talking about, mm-hmm. but it, there are mechanical constraints. Huge. And uh, we uh, talked about everything being in CAD, uh, being nominal values in CAD. Mm-hmm. So it there's a natural dialogue that designers, in order to design, have to have with each other uh, with regards to uh, these nominal settings and these nominal layout features and geometries uh so 3d cad 3d capability step files and things uh have made things a lot easier to visualize and you can check alignments and things uh but again want to want to look at i'm still learning how to use the tool Mm -hmm. in consideration with tolerancing uh i can see a very nominal conditions like uh uh a mounting boss, a nylon mounting boss is centered within a, uh, a hole on the board. It looks really nice, but I know that uh, that hole is perfect in the step file. Yeah. I have to consider as a designer what kind of tolerancing, that locational tolerancing and diametrical yep. uh, diameter tolerancing yep. uh, that that hole has. So uh, it's something I have to encourage myself, admonish myself without trying to admonish others. That's not my purpose here. Uh, inspire others right. to consider the, the not beyond the nominal condition. Right. And so I'd, I'd love to see the tools of the future as they evolve, uh, be able to address that somehow. And, you know, about the best we have uh, in the design world is to design our, maybe our part bodies at a maximum material condition or something like that or oh, right uh but wouldn't that be nice if we could yeah it's a we, really good point if actually. we could t- toggle back and forth we could snap yeah, back and that's forth what i was thinking i was imagining to max. Like, rrr, rrr, yeah. like, max. Min to max i yeah. could yeah that's what i was that was i was picturing yeah. in my mind if you could open and close down that hole and wouldn't see. that be cool yeah yeah and check for the god things. our r&d guys right now are screaming when they're listening to this uh, like no, uh, no uh, i don't it's know only encur- <laughs> it's only encouragement that you know that might be somewhere that we're going there's a um there is a term uh, that I'm loving right now that's a buzz term that's been out for a while, I, I guess, uh, where the industry is bringing together the electrical constraints, the electrical designers, and the mechanical designers, which theoretically all are going to become merged into one designer pretty soon, yeah. uh, sooner than we know. And it's, it, 
it's called mechatronics, right? Yep. And I've heard there's courses being taught in mechatronics, and yep. it's just that to me is an inspiring place to go. I'm too old to go to school again. I know. But I feel like I'm in school every day, you know, with yeah, the, uh, it's learning true. New, new software tools and things. Every every day we go to work and we we uh, lay down tracks or uh, have to address problems. It's like a new day in school. It is. Uh, are we going to be Are we going to BS our way through something, or are we really going to get into uh, what's going on here and learn about it. And, you know, that may mean a, uh, a call to the supplier. Right. What are your, how do I handle this? What are your capabilities? And not forgetting that just because we talked to that one supplier, that doesn't mean the rest of the suppliers have it's those capabilities. Absolutely Ooh, true. Another thing, since we're, we're kind of freestyling here. Yeah, we are. No, uh, this that, is that made me think of a pet, a pet um, topic. Uh, and that is, Prototype versus production. Uh, how, how do we design and prototype versus how do we design and pr production? Just because uh, we can go to a supplier uh, that'll quick turn a board for us in a few days. Uh, yeah. The biggest mistake, let me, let me go with case scenario. The biggest mistake I see uh, engineers make, some designers, is they'll get a, a, a design made at a, a quick turn board house. Uh -huh. And guess what? They'll get it back into their shop. Uh, their shop. They'll they'll give it to a tech, have it assembled. You know what? That thing works perfect. Yeah. Okay. And it's made with all these special core materials and special mm -hmm. uh, weights of copper. Uh, it's been printed and etched just <laughs> fine. It's got purple solder masks just like it's specified. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, because it's working perfect, they say, okay, let's go to print, and they want to go order a million of them. But that prototype shops not going to not going to be able to make a million of them right right so you know it's going offshore yeah, let's go to china or taiwan or right. wherever yeah so what do you think is going to happen to and that gonna... specialized recipe that yeah uh, the the designer or the engineer has so uh, cut and paste the actual recipe of the design onto yeah. the board uh what's going to happen yeah, it's going to be a bloody disaster. It's going to get kicked back. Yeah, no bit. It'll probably It'll be, be no bit. Yeah. It'll just get kicked back. So, that you know, we're talking design. And uh, yeah. design involves uh, creating, you know, sometimes hybrid stack-ups. But we have to be so aware of where this project's pointing. Right. In order, uh, is it pointing Producible toward in production. If you're heading towards, uh, this is going into consumer market, you have to be thinking about that at the proto level. You cannot... Oh, let's just do this, you know, you know, Ferrari yeah. with all these special processes and then think that that's going to go into mass production because that takes, by the way, when you talked about Prototron and, and shops like that, I worked for a shop much like that. And there is guys hanging over that job doing, you know, kind of hand oh, yeah. carrying it through and making sure that everything goes perfect. Right. That's not sustainable in a production environment. Right. right. And, you know, that's not always understood. Yeah. That's right. That's it needs to be understood. Yeah. Um, it needs to be understood. Um, yeah. How do we get that done? Well, uh, how uh, it, it the awareness needs to I think I think it gets done, but it gets learnt the hard way yeah for right? sure and this is what ma that makes me feel um actually a lot of empathy for engineers is i feel like they're having to learn things over and over and over again that it's like reinventing the wheel over and over again instead of there being like some recipe book or some definitive guidelines you know of course cid plus and those things are are hugely enormously valuable yeah but the, i don't know that there's a there's a straight cut and dried answer for that because it's complex process yeah uh, back to the cid too uh you know guidelines the guidelines uh that the, the cid program uh points the designer to our specifications you know the it Again, I'm a I'm a big proponent of not only getting a designers not only getting designers out to the uh, board shops, EMS shops, uh, but out to the trade shows. I mean, uh, if yeah. you if you're a design, I ask the students in the CID courses, uh, y'all been to trade shows? 
Y'all been to uh, Apex or uh, PCB West or you know SMT uh, A shows uh, and Design Con like we are here right now? If you haven't been out to these shows, you you might be missing out. This is not only a great place to shake hands and talk uh, to people that are in the biz of you know selling the products right. but it's a net just like we're doing right now it's a networking opportunity and yeah. a lot of your learning as a designer is going to come from networking and in a trade show you can do it like at hyper speed like <laughs> you can take in so much in two or three days like uh, drinking from the fire hose level like right. you or can learn drinking. so much yeah or, yeah well that's <laughs> yeah there's that too <laughs> drinking from the fire hose and then drinking <laughs> Um, so, no, you can take in so much information in, in that period of time. Yeah. So, um, how often do you teach the CID courses, Kelly? The, the EPTAC uh, has been a, a, a instructor, a supplier of teachers for many, many uh, mm-hmm. of the IPC specifications. Uh, they're, they're based back east, New Hampshire. Yeah. And... Uh, they uh, they have for the CID program they have uh, a dozen or so instructors. Again, these these instructors were uh, pretty much handpicked out of the industry uh, to be able to go out uh, and teach these classes. However, you know a lot of them, myself included, we have day jobs. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, it'd be nice to be. I'd. I'd Teaching is so uh, positive. I, I would love to do it every day, but I would right. never want to get burned out. And and the travel involved, right. uh, because they're offered all around all around the United States, Canada, mm-hmm. even down in South America. We have instructors. Uh, well, Mike Creeden. Mike put, Creeden is like Mike, a globetrotter. Yeah, he is. He's putting <laughs> lots of miles on. He sure uh, is. Uh, doing classes down in. Uh, down south, yeah, way down way south. Way down south, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, we keep it to, you know, three to four classes spread out among the, uh, the instructors. The yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so it keeps it fun, keeps it manageable, uh, and, and uh, keeps us fresh, I guess. So it's about time to wrap up, but I feel like we just got started. We could go on and on, but thank you so much for oh, this pleasure. conversation. And boy, I really see eye to eye with you. I bet you've articulated it so much better than I could. So thank you so much, Kelly. Um, okay, my last question for you. I think I already know the answer, but I'm going to ask it. So at the end of the um, On Track podcast, I've observed that many people who are designers have interesting uh, creative hobbies or things they do so this part of the podcast we call designers after hours <laughs> so i know one talent you have after hours so tell me what you do for fun with that creative brain of yours wow. uh, after hours uh, you know I, I just recently moved to spokane so there's not many after hours after hours gets dark really fast up there <laughs> in the winter time uh, however uh, in the summertime, it's just the opposite. We have lots of daylight up in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, I don't know if this this is what the answer you're looking for, but one of the purposes of moving up there was to uh, fulfill a bucket list of getting a hobby farm and raising cows. No way. Yeah, yeah. I didn't so, know. I wasn't so going for that, but that's I know cool. You I know you weren't. So I, I, we, we did the hobby farm part. We, we moved to Spokane. Wait, wait, time got, out. What's got, a hobby farm? A hobby farm is where you really don't know what you're doing. Some, some folks call it gentleman farmers. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, too yeah, nice yeah. of a term. So yeah. I call it. We call it a hobby farm. And uh, so far, we've got the chickens down. We had 16 chickens laying eggs, uh, and. A lot of we, we have 26 acres that wow. and a barn that we're gonna put uh, we're gonna put cows on. But uh, a, a sage old guy, one of my neighbors, told me, you know, Kelly. Uh, I asked him about the, what do you need to do to get cows going. He says the first thing you need to do is build good fences. And I'm going, <laughs> oh, oh yeah. So for two years now, I've been trying to build good fences and uh, and. Uh, the only thing I've been doing is tearing them down in the industry by shaking hands. How's that for an ending? <laughs> yeah, so tearing ah. down fences, shaking hands with the stakeholders. Uh, that was corny. So yeah, you're like a stand-up 
comedian. No. Well, what I was really pointing at, and then I swear we will stop talking, <laughs> is about your musical outlet. Oh, that. Yeah, uh, did a lot of did a lot of uh, really really fun uh, stuff over the last couple decades with uh, the Porch Dogs. Remember the Porch, porch Dogs? Porch Dogs, they're uh, awesome. Pete Waddell and the Porch Dogs. Oh my goodness! Uh, yeah, oh, they used to play at shows sometimes. By the way, uh, yeah. every time. Yeah, it was we, so fun. Yeah, it was or it is. Do it's you still even do it? fun to think about. Yeah, uh, so I'm a hacker. I, I play a little blues harp and a little guitar i'm a guitar hacker but it's it's another thing where uh this uh this industry needs an outlet and interestingly enough uh the designer type is typically right-brained right that's what i'm saying a lot of them are musicians or like bill brooks sculpting right like there's like i love I think that's, I don't know, I really love hanging out with designers. Yeah, so to, to get together, it, you know, it was a natural uh, occurrence to, to start playing music and jamming. It's to, so uh, Pete Waddell was a, a great uh, uh, mentor for me way back years and So Pete and years Waddell, ago. for our listeners, is the publisher at UP Media. So not only a, an industry guru, but... Founded the Porch founded Dogs. Founded the Porch Dogs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so. And uh, so we played and played and I met so many great people uh, through that. And uh, we ca- we still carry on uh, so fun. F- at, at trade shows. Somebody will bring their guitar. Somebody will bring a harp. And that's all we need. To, that's all to we have need. Some fun. Have You're some so fun. fun. OK, Kelly, thanks so much for joining me. I could talk to you all day. My so pleasure, great to Judy. connect. Yes. We only get to connect at trade shows. But now I want to come to your hobby farm. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Where are your boots? <laughs> I have them. I used to have horse. <laughs> well, that's it for this uh, edition of On Track Podcast. Thank you so much for joining, and we'll see you next time.